the battle in Berlin was an end phase of the Battle of Berlin. While the Battle of Berlin encompassed the attack by three Soviet army groups to capture not only Berlin but the territory of Germany east of the River Elbe still under German control. The battle in Berlin details the fighting and German capitulation that took place within the city. The outcome of the battle to capture the capital of Nazi Germany was decided during the initial phases of the Battle of Berlin that took place outside the city. As the Soviets invested Berlin and the German forces placed to stop them were destroyed or forced back, the city's fate was sealed. Nevertheless, there was heavy fighting within the city as the Red Army fought its way, street by street, into the center. On April 23, 1945, the first Soviet ground forces started to penetrate the outer suburbs of Berlin. By 27 April, Berlin was completely cut off from the outside world. The battle in the city continued until May 2, 1945. On that date, the commander of the Berlin Defense Area, General Helmut Weidling, surrendered to the commander of the Soviet Eighth Guards Army, Lt. Gen. Vasily Chukov. Chukov was a constituent of Marshal Georgi Zhukov's 1st Belarusian Front. The sector in which most of the fighting in the overall battle took place was the Silo Heights, the last major defensive line outside Berlin. The Battle of the Silo Heights was one of the last pitched battles of World War II. It was fought over four days, from 16 April until April 19, 1945. Close to 1 million Soviet soldiers and more than 20,000 tanks and artillery pieces were in action to break through the gates to Berlin which was defended by about 100,000 German soldiers and 1,200 tanks and guns. On 19th of April, the fourth day, the 1st Belarusian Front broke through the final line of the Silo Heights and nothing but broken German formations lay between them and Berlin. Marshal Ivan Konev's 1st Ukrainian Front, having captured force the day before, was fanning out into open country. One powerful thrust was heading northwest towards Berlin while other armies headed west towards a section of United States Army front line southwest of the city who were on the Elbe. By the end of 19th of April the German eastern front line north of Frankfurt around Silo and to the south around Forst had ceased to exist. These breakthroughs allowed the two Soviet fronts to envelop the German 9th Army in a large pocket east of Frankfurt. Attempts by the 9th Army to break out to the west would result in the Battle of Halba. The cost of the Soviet forces had been very high between 1 and 19 April, with over 2,807 tanks lost, including at least 727 at the Silo Heights. Soviet tanks and self-propelled guns on the streets of Berlin on 20th of April, Adolf Hitler's birthday, Soviet artillery of the 79th Rifle Corps of the 1st Belarusian Front first shelled Berlin. Thereafter, Soviet artillery continued the bombardment of Berlin and did not stop until the city surrendered, the weight of explosives delivered by their artillery during the battle was greater than the tonnage dropped by the Western Allied bombers on the city. The 1st Belarusian Front advanced towards the east and northeast of the city. The 1st Ukrainian Front had pushed through the last formations of the northern wing of General Ferdinand Schirner's Army Group Center and had passed north of Juterbach, well over halfway to the American front line on the Elba at Magdeburg. To the north between Stettin and Schwedt, Konstantin Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front attacked the northern flank of General Gotthard Heinrichs' Army Group Vistula, held by Hasso von Monteufel's 3rd Panzer Army. By 24 April, elements of the 1st Belarusian Front and the 1st Ukrainian Front had completed the encirclement of the city. The next day, 25 April, the 2nd Belarusian Front broke through the 3rd Panzer Army's line around the bridgehead south of Stettin and crossed the Rando Swamp. They were now free to move west towards the British 21st Army Group and north towards the Baltic port of Stralsund. The Soviet 58th Guards Rifle Division of Zadov's 5th Guards Army made contact with the 69th Infantry Division of the 1st United States Army near Torgau on the Elba. The Soviet investment of Berlin was consolidated with leading units probing and penetrating the S-Bahn defensive ring. By the end of 25th of April, there was no prospect that the German defense of the city could do anything but temporarily delay the capture of the capital by the Soviets as the decisive stages of the battle had already been fought and lost by the Germans fighting outside the city. Defense barricades at Emke Square, Charlottenburg, April 1945 on 20th of April, Hitler ordered and the Wehrmacht initiated Operation Clausewitz, which called for the complete evacuation of all Wehrmacht and SS offices in Berlin, this essentially formalized Berlin's status as a frontline city. The forces available to artillery General Helmut Weidling for the city's defense included several severely depleted Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS divisions, in all about 45,000 men. These formations were supplemented by the Berlin Police Force, child soldiers in the compulsory Hitler Youth, 
and the Volkssturm militia of males not already in the military. Many of the 40,000 elderly men of the Volkssturm had been in the army as young men and some were veterans of World War I. Hitler appointed SS Brigade for a Wilhelm Mont commander of the city's central government district. Monk's command post was in bunkers under the Reich Chancellery. The core group of his fighting men were the 800 members of the 1st SS Panzer Division Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler Guard Battalion. He had a total of over 2,000 men under his command. Weidling organized the defenses into eight sectors designated A to H, each commanded by a colonel or a general, but most had no combat experience. The 20th Infantry Division was to the west of the city, the 9th Parachute Division to the north, Panzer Division Munchberg to the northeast, the 11th SS Volunteer Panzergrenadier Division Nordland to the southeast, and to the east of Tempelhof Airport. The reserve, the 18th Panzergrenadier Division, was in Berlin's central district. A Soviet combat group was a mixed arms unit of about 80 men in assault groups of 6 to 8 soldiers, closely supported by field artillery. These were tactical units which were able to apply the tactics of house-to-house -house fighting that they had been forced to develop and refine at each Festungstadt they had encountered since Stalingrad. Berlin apartment blocks in 1900. The German tactics used for urban warfare in Berlin were dictated by three considerations, the experience that they had gained during five years of war, the physical characteristics of the city, and the methods used by the Soviets. Most of the central districts of Berlin consist of city blocks with straight wide roads and contain several waterways, parks and large railway marshalling yards. It is a predominantly flat area, with some low hills such as Kreuzberg, which is 66 meters above sea level. Much of the housing stock consisted of apartment blocks built in the second half of the 19th century. Most of those, thanks to housing regulations and few elevators, were five stories high and built around a courtyard that could be reached from the street through a corridor large enough to accommodate a horse and cart or a small delivery truck. In many places, these apartment blocks were built around several courtyards, one behind the other, each reached through the outer courtyards by a ground-level corridor similar to that between the first courtyard and then the road. The larger, more expensive flats faced the street while the smaller, more modest dwellings were grouped around the inner courtyards. A devastated street in the city center, July 3, 1945 just as the Soviets had learned a lot about urban warfare, so had the Germans. The Waffen SS did not use makeshift barricades erected close to street corners, because these could be raked by artillery fire from guns firing over open sites further along the straight streets. Instead, they put snipers and machine guns on the upper floors and roofs because the Soviet tanks could not elevate their guns that high and simultaneously they put men armed with Panzerfaust anti-tank weapons in cellar windows to ambush tanks as they moved down the streets. These tactics were quickly adopted by the Hitler Youth and the Volkssturm. Initially Soviet tanks advanced down the middle of the streets, but to counter the German tactics, they altered their own and started. To hug the sides of the streets, this allowed for supporting crossfire from tanks either side of the wider thoroughfares. The Soviets also mounted submachine gunners on the tanks who sprayed every doorway and window, but this meant the tank could not traverse its turret quickly. Another solution was to rely on heavy howitzers firing over open sites to blast defended buildings and to use anti-aircraft guns against the German gunners on the higher floors. Soviet combat groups started to move from house to house instead of directly down the streets. They moved through the apartments and cellars, blasting holes through the walls of adjacent buildings, while others fought across the rooftops and through the attics. These enfilading tactics took the Germans lying in ambush for tanks in the flanks. Flamethrowers and grenades proved to be very effective, but as the Berlin civilian population had not been evacuated, these tactics inevitably killed many non-combatants. Howitzer before firing on the streets of Berlin with the decisive stages of the battle being fought outside the city, Berlin's fate was sealed, yet the resistance inside continued. On 23rd of April, Hitler appointed German artillery general Helmut Weidling commander of the Berlin defense area. Only a day earlier, Hitler had ordered that Weidling be executed by firing squad. This was due to a misunderstanding concerning a retreat order issued by Weidling as commander of the LVI Panzer Corps. On 20th of April, Weidling had been appointed commander of the LVI Panzer Corps. Weidling replaced Lt. Col. Ernst Kether as commander of Berlin. Only one day earlier, Kether had replaced Lt. Gen. Helmut Reimann, who had held the position for only about a month. By 23rd of April, some of Chukas rifle units had crossed the Spree and Dama River south of Kupenik and by 24th of April were advancing towards Brits and Neukölln. Accompanying them were the leading tanks of Colonel General Mikhail Katukov's 1st Guards Tank Army. 
Sometime after midnight, a corps of Colonel General Nikolai Berzerin's 5th Shock Army crossed the spree close to Trepto Park. At dawn on 24th of April the LVI Panzer Corps still under Weidling's direct command, counterattacked, but were severely mauled by the 5th Shock Army, which was able to continue its advance around midday. Meanwhile, the first large Soviet probe into the city was put into operation. Katukov's 1st Guards tank army attacked across the Telto Canal. At 6.20 a bombardment by 3,000 guns and heavy mortars began. At 7 o'clock hours the 1st Soviet battalions were across, to be followed by tanks around 12 o'clock, shortly after the first of the pontoon bridges were completed. By the evening Trepto Park was in Soviet hands and they had also reached the S-Bahn. While the fighting raged in the southeast of the city, between 320 and 330 French volunteers commanded by SS Brigade Fuhrer Gustav Krukenberg and organized as Sturm Battalion Charlemagne were attached to 11 SS Panzergrenadier Division Nordland. They moved from the SS training ground near Neustrelitz to the center of Berlin through the western suburbs, which apart from unmanned barricades across the Havel and Spree were devoid of fortifications or defenders. Of all the reinforcements ordered to Berlin that day, only this Sturm Battalion arrived. The location of Neukölln on 25th of April, Krukenberg was appointed commander of Defense Sector C which included the Nordland Division, whose previous commander, Joachim Ziegler, was relieved of his command the same day. The arrival of the French SS men bolstered the Nordland Division whose Norga and Denmark regiments had been decimated in the fighting. Just midday as Krukenberg reached his command, the last German bridgehead south of the Telto Canal was being abandoned. During the night Krukenberg informed General Hans Krebs, Chief of the General Staff of Oberkommando De Harris that within 24 hours the Nordland would have to fall back to the Central Sector Z. Soviet combat groups of the 8th Guards Army and the 1st Guards Tank Army fought their way through the southern suburbs of Neukölln towards Tempelhof Airport which was located just inside the S-Bahn defensive ring. Defending Sector D was Panzer Division Munchberg. This division, down to its last dozen tanks and 30 armored personnel carriers S, had been promised replacements for battle losses but only stragglers and Volkssturm were available to fill the ranks. The Soviets advanced cautiously, using flamethrowers to overcome defensive positions. By dusk Soviet T-34 tanks had reached the airfield, only 6 kilometers south of the Fuhrer bunker, where they were checked by stiff German resistance. The Munchberg division managed to hold the line until the afternoon of the next day, but this was the last time they were able to check the Soviet advance for more than a few hours. On 26 April, with Neukölln heavily penetrated by Soviet combat groups, Krukenberg prepared fallback positions for Sector C defenders around her manplatz. He moved his headquarters into the Opera House. The two understrength German divisions defending the southeast were now facing five Soviet armies. From east to west they were, the 5th Shock Army, advancing from Trepto Park, the 8th Guards Army and the 1st Guards Tank Army moving through Neukölln north and Colonel General Pavel Rybako's 3rd Guards Tank Army advancing from Mariendorf. As the Nordland Division fell back towards her manplatz, the French SS and 100 Hitler Youth attached to their group destroyed 14 Soviet. Tanks with Panzerfausts, one machine gun position by the Hollandsee Bridge managed to hold up any Soviet advances in that area for 48 hours. The Nordland's remaining armor, 8 Tiger tanks and several assault guns, were ordered to take up positions in the Tiergarten because although these two divisions of Weidling's LVI Panzer Corps could slow the Soviet advance, they could not stop it. SS Abershar Fuhrer Schmidt recalled, I was assigned as platoon leader of a dwindled company which included a squad of Hungarian volunteers. Volkssturm men, Hitlerjugend, as well as members of the Heer, Army, daily, the Russians advanced closer to the government quarter. Which we were to defend. It became more and more difficult to hold the line under all circumstances. Hitler summoned Field Marshal. Robert Ritter von Grimm from Munich to Berlin to take over command of the German Air Force from Hermann Göring. While flying over Berlin in a Fessler Stork, von Grimm was seriously wounded by Soviet anti-aircraft fire. Hennerreich, his mistress and a crack test pilot, landed von Grimm on an improvised air strip in the Tiergarten near the Brandenburg Gate. At Tempelhof Airport, the flak batteries conducted direct fire against advancing Soviet tanks until they were overrun. On the following day, 27th of April, 2,000 German women were rounded up and ordered to help clear Tempelhof Airport of debris so that the Red Army Air Force could start to use it. Marshal Zhukov appointed Colonel General Berzerin to start organizing the German civil administration in the areas that they had captured. Burgermeister, 
just as the directors of the Berlin Utilities, were summoned to appear before Berzerin staff. As the Soviet armies of the 1st Belarusian Front and the 1st Ukrainian Front converged on the center of the city there were many accidental friendly fire incidents involving artillery. Shelling because the spotter planes and the artillery of the different Soviet fronts were not coordinated and frequently mistook assault groups and other armies as enemy troops. Indeed, the rivalry between the Soviet armies to capture the city center was becoming intense. A corps commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front joked with laconic humor, Now we should be scared not of the enemy, but of our neighbor. There's nothing more depressing in Berlin than learning about the successes of your neighbor. Beaver has suggested that the rivalry went further than just jokes and says that Chukov deliberately ordered the left flank of the 8th Guards Army across the front of the 3rd Guards Tank Army, blocking its direct path to the Reichstag. As Chukov did not inform Rybako, commander of the 3rd Guards Tank Army, that the 8th was doing this, the troops ordered to carry out this maneuver suffered disproportionate casualties from friendly fire. Humboldt in Flak Tower in 2004 in the southwest, Rybako's 3rd Guards Tank Army, supported by Lt. Gen. Lukinsky's 28th Army, were advancing through the wooded park and suburbs of the Grunewald. Attacking what remained of the 18th Panzergrenadier Division on their eastern flank and entering Charlottenburg. In the south, Chukov's 8th Guards Army and Katukov's 1st Guards Tank Army crossed the Landwehr Canal on 27th of April, the last major obstacle between them and the four bunker next to the Reich Chancellery less than 2 kilometers away. In the southeast, Bergeron's 5th Shock Army had bypassed the Friedrichshain Flak Tower and was now between Frankfurter Alle and the south bank of the Spree, where its 9 Corps was fighting. By 27th of April the Soviet armies had penetrated the Germans' S-Bahn outer defensive ring from all directions. The Germans had been forced back into a pocket about 25 kilometers long from west to east and about 3 kilometers wide at its narrowest, just west of the old city center, near the Tiergarten. In the northwest, Lt. Gen. F. I. Perkarovich's 47th Army was now approaching Spandau, and was also heavily involved in a battle to capture Gatto Airfield, which was defended by Volkssturm and Luftwaffe cadets using the feared 88mm anti-aircraft guns in their anti-tank role. In the north, Colonel General Semyon Bogdanov's 2nd Guards Tank Army was bogged down just south of Siemenstadt. Colonel General Vasily Kuznetsov's 3rd Shock Army had bypassed the Humboldt and Flak Tower, and had reached the north of the Tiergarten and Prenzlauerberg. On the morning of 27th of April, the Soviets continued the assault with a heavy bombardment of the inner city. The 8th Guards Army and the 1st Guards Tank Army were ordered to take Bell Alliance plots, Bell Alliance being an alternative name for the battle of Waterloo, that in a twist of history was defended by French SS soldiers of Sturmbattail and Charlemagne attached to the Nordland Division. That night Veidling gave a battle situation report to Hitler, and presented him with a detailed breakout plan which would be spearheaded with just under 40 tanks. Hitler rejected the plan, saying he would stay in the bunker and that Veidling would carry on with the defense. In Sector Z Krukenberg Nordland Divisional Headquarters was now a carriage in the Stadtmeet U-Bahn station. The Nordland's armor was reduced to four captured Soviet armored personnel carriers and two half-tracks, so Kronberg's men's chief weapon was now. The Panzerfaust which were used for close-quarters battle against both Soviet armor and in house-to-house fighting against Soviet combat groups. At dawn on 28th of April, the youth divisions Clausewitz, Scharnhorst, and Theodor Korner, attacked from the southwest in the direction of Berlin. They were part of Wenck's 20 Corps and were made up of men from the officer training schools, making them some of the best units the Germans had left. They covered a distance of about 24 kilometers, before being halted at the tip of Lake Schwilo southwest of Potsdam and still 32 kilometers from Berlin. In the evening of 28th of April, the BBC broadcast a Reuters news report about Heinrich Himmler's attempted negotiations with the Western Allies through Count Folk Bernadotte in Lübeck. Upon being informed, Hitler flew into a rage and told those who were still with him in the bunker complex that Himmler's act was the worst treachery he had ever known. Hitler ordered von Grimm and Reich to fly to Karl Dunitz's headquarters at Plön and arrest the traitor Himmler. By 28th of April, the Munchberg division had been driven back to the Anhalter railway station less than one kilometer south of the Fuhrer bunker. To slow the advancing Soviets, allegedly on Hitler's orders, the bulkheads under the Landwehr Canal were blown up. It caused panic in the U-Bahn tunnels under the Anhalter railway station in which some were trampled to death. But the water level only suddenly rose by about one meter and after that much more slowly. Initially it was thought that many thousands had drowned, 
but when the tunnels were pumped out in October 1945 it was found that most of the bodies were of people who had died of their wounds, not from drowning. In any event, the Soviets continued their advance with three T-34s, making it as far as Wilhelmstrasse u bahn station before being ambushed and destroyed by the Frenchmen of the Nordland Division. During 27 and 28 of April, most of the formations of Konev's 1st Ukrainian Front that were engaged in the battle in Berlin were ordered to disengage and proceed south to take part in the Prague Offensive. This did not mitigate their resentment at being denied the honor of capturing the center of Berlin, but left the 1st Belarusian Front under Marshal Zhukov to claim that honor for themselves alone. By 28 of April, the Germans were now reduced to a strip less than 5 kilometers wide and 15 kilometers in length, from Alexanderplatz in the east to Charlottenburg and the area around the Olympic Stadium in the west. Generally, the Soviets avoided fighting their way into tunnels and bunkers, instead, they sealed them off and continued the advance. However, just over one kilometer to the north of the Reichstag the 3rd Shock Army did use heavy guns at point-blank range to blast a hole in the walls of Mobi prison, after a breach was made and the prison stormed. The garrison there quickly surrendered. The 3rd Shock Army were in sight of the Victory Column in the Tiergarten and during the afternoon advanced towards the Moltke Bridge over the Spree, just north of the Ministry of the Interior and a mere 600 meters from the Reichstag. German demolition charges damaged the Moltke Bridge but left it still passable to infantry. As dusk fell and under heavy artillery bombardment, the 1st Soviet troops crossed the bridge. By midnight, the Soviet 150th and 171st Rifle Divisions had secured the bridgehead against any counterattack the Germans could muster. On 28th of April, Krebs made his last telephone call from the Fuhrer bunker. He called Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, the chief of Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, in Furstenberg. Krebs told Keitel that, if relief did not arrive within 48 hours, all would be lost. Keitel promised to exert the utmost pressure on Generals Walter Wenck, commander of 12th Army, and Theodore Bussey, commander of the 9th Army. Meanwhile, Hitler's private secretary Martin Bormann wired to the head of the Navy Admiral Dunitz, the, Reich Chancellery, is, a heap of rubble. He went on to say that the foreign press was reporting fresh acts of treason and that without exception Scherner, Wenck and the others must give evidence of their loyalty by the quickest relief of the Fuhrer. During the evening, von Grimm and Reich flew out from Berlin in an Arado R-96 trainer. Von Grimm was ordered to get the Luftwaffe to attack the Soviet forces that had just reached Potsdamer Platz, and to make sure that Himmler was punished. Fearing that Hitler was escaping in the plane, troops of the Soviet Third Shock Army, which was fighting its way through the Tiergarten from the north, tried to shoot down the Arado but the plane took off successfully. During the night of 28th of April, Wenck reported to Keitel that his 12th Army had been forced back along the entire front. This was particularly true of 20 corps that had been able to establish temporary contact with the Potsdam garrison. According to Wenck, no relief for Berlin by his army was now possible. This was even more so as support from the 9th Army could no longer be expected. Keitel gave Wenck permission to break off his attempt to relieve Berlin. At 4 o'clock hours on 29th of April, in the Fuhrer bunker, General Wilhelm Bergdorf, Goebbels, Krebs, and Bormann witnessed and signed the last will and testament of Adolf Hitler. Hitler dictated the document to Trottel Junge, shortly after he had married Eva Braun. The Molka Bridge around 1900 after Rokossovsky's second Belarusian front had broken out of their bridgehead, General Heinrich I disobeyed Hitler's direct orders and allowed von Monteufel's request for a general withdrawal of the 3rd Panzer Army. By 29th of April, Army Group Vistula headquarters staff could no longer contact the 9th Army, so there was little in the way of coordination that Heinrich I's staff could still to do. As Heinrich I had disobeyed a direct order from Hitler, he was relieved of his command. However, von Monteufel refused Cattell's request that he take over, and although ordered to report to OKW headquarters, Heinrich I dallied and never arrived. Cattell later recalled the incident in his memoirs and said that command passed to the senior army commander of the 21st Army, General Kurt von Tippelskirch. Other sources claim that von Tippelskirch's appointment was temporary and only until the arrival of General Kurt Stuten. Student was captured by British forces and never arrived. Whether von Tippelskirch or Student or both took command, the rapidly deteriorating situation that the Germans faced meant that army. Group Vistula's coordination of the armies under its nominal command during the last few days of the war were of little significance. In the early hours of 29th of April, the 150th and 171st Rifle Divisions started to fan out from the Moltke bridgehead into the surrounding streets and buildings. 
Initially the Soviets were unable to bring forward artillery, as the combat engineers had not had time to strengthen the bridge or build an alternative. The only form of heavy weaponry available to the assault troops were individual Katyusha rockets lashed to short sections of railway lines. Major General Shatilov's 150th Rifle Division had a particularly hard fight, capturing the heavily fortified Ministry of the Interior Building. Lacking artillery, the men had to clear it room by room with grenades and submachine guns. In the southeast at dawn on 29 April, Colonel Antonov's 301st Rifle Division pressed on with its assault. After very heavy fighting, the formation managed to capture the Gestapo headquarters on Prince Albrechtstrasse, but a Waffen SS counterattack forced the regiments of the division to withdraw from the structure. Still confined to the building were seven inmates who had been spared in the massacre of other prisoners on 23 April. To the southwest, Chukov's 8th Guards Army attacked north across the Landwehr Canal into the Tiergarten. The Nordland Division was now under Mod Central Command. All the men were exhausted from days and nights of continuous fighting. The Frenchmen of the Nordland had proved particularly good at destroying tanks, of the 108 Soviet tanks knocked out in the central district, they had accounted for about half of them. That afternoon the last two Knights Crosses of the Third Reich were awarded, one went to Frenchman Eugène Vallot, who had personally destroyed eight tanks. The other was awarded to SS Sturmbahnführer Friedrich Herzig, the commander of the 503 SS Heavy Panzer Battalion. Two other men received less prestigious awards for only knocking out five tanks each. During the evening of 29th of April, at Weidling's headquarters in the Bendler block, now within meters of the front line, Weidling discussed with his divisional commanders, the possibility of breaking out to the southwest to link up with the 12th Army. Whose spearhead had reached the village of Furk in Brandenburg on the banks of the Schwielauze near Potsdam. The breakout was planned to start the next night at 2200 hours. Late in the evening, Krebs contacted General Alfred Yodel by radio, request immediate report. Firstly of the whereabouts of Weng's spearheads. Secondly of time intended to attack. Thirdly of the location of the 9th Army. Fourthly of the precise place in which the 9th Army will break through. Fifthly of the whereabouts of General Rudolf Holst's spearhead. In the early morning of 30th of April, Yodel replied to Krebs, firstly, Weng's spearhead bogged down south of Schwilo Lake. Secondly, 12th Army therefore unable to continue attack on Berlin. Thirdly, bulk of 9 Army surrounded. Fourthly, Holst's corps on the defensive. Battle for the Reichstag by this time, several smaller. Polish units had already taken part in the battle in Berlin. Soviet forces were lacking infantry support, and armored units, without infantry support, were taking heavy casualties. As of 30th of April, the Soviet forces were joined by the Polish 1st Tadeusz Kostyushka Infantry Division after a request from the Soviet command for infantry reinforcements. Originally, one infantry regiment was to support the 1st Mechanized Corps, and two, the 12th Guards Tank Corps. Contrary to the original plan, two regiments ended up supporting the 1st Corps, and only one the 12th Corps. The 3rd Polish Infantry Regiment was operating with the 66th Guards Tank Brigade of the 12th Guards Tank Corps. The 1st Polish Infantry Regiment was split up into combat teams supporting the 19th and 35th Mechanized Brigades, with the 2nd Polish Infantry Regiment supporting the 219th Tank Brigade all units of the Soviet 1st Mechanized Corps. Upon arrival, the Polish forces found that the Soviet units had suffered tremendous losses, the 19th and 35th Mechanized Brigades had sustained over 90% casualties. And thus the Polish 1st Infantry Regiment originally assigned to support them had to, in effect, take over their tasks. The 66th Guards Tank Brigade of the 12th Corps that received the 3rd Polish Infantry Regiment for support had similarly taken heavy losses, having already lost 82 tanks due to insufficient infantry cover. Battle for the Reichstag at 6 o'clock on 30th of April the 150th Rifle Division had still not captured the upper floors of the Ministry of the Interior. But while the fighting was still going on, the 150th launched an attack from there across the 400 meters of Königsplatz towards the Reichstag. For the Soviets, the Reichstag was the symbol of the Third Reich, it was of such significant value that the Soviets wanted to capture it before the May Day Parade in Moscow. The assault was not an easy one. The Germans had dug a complicated network of trenches around the building and a collapsed tunnel had filled with water from the spree forming a moat across Königsplatz. The initial infantry assault was decimated by cross-fire from the Reichstag and the Kroll Opera House on the western side of Königsplatz. By now the spree had been bridged and the Soviets were able to bring up tanks and artillery to support fresh assaults by the infantry, 
some of which were tasked with outflanking the Opera House and attacking it from the northwest. By 10 o'clock the soldiers of the 150th had reached the moat, but accurate fire from 12. 8 cm Flak 40 anti-aircraft guns, 2 km away high on the Flak Tower close by the Berlin Zoo, prevented any further successful advance across the moat during daylight. Throughout the rest of the day, as 90 artillery pieces, some as large as the 203 mm howitzer, as well as Katyusha rocket launchers, bombarded the Reichstag and its defensive trenches. Colonel Nagoda's 171st Rifle Division, on the left flank of the 150th, continued to capture the buildings of the diplomatic quarter to the north of Koenigsplatz. Zuflak Tower after the end of fighting, May 1945 as the perimeter shrank and the surviving defenders fell back on the center, they became concentrated. By now, there were about 10,000 soldiers in the city center, who were being assaulted from all sides. One of the other main thrusts was along Wilhelmstrasse on which the Air Ministry building, which was built of reinforced concrete, was situated. It was pounded by large concentrations of Soviet artillery. The remaining German Tiger tanks of the Hermann von Salza battalion took up positions in the east of the Tiergarten to defend the center against the Third Shock Army, which, although heavily engaged around the Reichstag, was also flanking the area by advancing through the northern Tiergarten, and the 8th Guards Army advancing through the south of the Tiergarten. These Soviet forces had effectively cut the sausage-shaped area held by the Germans in half and made an escape to the west for those German troops in the center much more difficult. During the morning, Monk informed Hitler the center would be able to hold for less than two days. Later that morning, Weidling informed Hitler in person that the defenders would probably exhaust their ammunition that night and again asked Hitler permission to break out. At about 1300 hours, Weidling, who was back in his headquarters in the Bendler block, finally received Hitler's permission to attempt a breakout. During the afternoon, Hitler shot himself and Braun took cyanide. In accordance with Hitler's instructions, the bodies were burned in the garden of the Reich Chancellery. In accordance with Hitler's last will and testament, Joseph Goebbels, the Minister for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, became the new head of government and Chancellor of Germany. At 3.15 a.m., Reichskanzler Goebbels and Bormann sent a radio message to Admiral Dunitz informing him of Hitler's death. For Hitler's last wishes, Dunitz was appointed as the new president of Germany. Starting from 1600 hours on 30th of April, the 1st Battalion of the Polish 1st Regiment began an assault on a barricade on Pestalozzistrasse. A major obstacle which made previous tank attacks in that direction suicidal. The Polish 2nd and 3rd Regiments cleared the path through the barricades on Goethestrasse and Schillerstrasse for the tanks of the Soviet 19th Brigade. Polish flag raised on the top of Berlin Victory Column on May 2, 1945 because of the smoke, dust came early to the center of Berlin. At 1800 hours hours, while Weidling and his staff finalized their breakout plans in the Bendler block, three regiments of the Soviet 150th Rifle Division, under cover of a heavy artillery barrage and closely supported by tanks, assaulted the Reichstag. All the windows were bricked up, but the soldiers managed to force the main doors and enter the main hall. The German garrison, of about 1,000 defenders fired down on the Soviets from above, turning the main hall into a medieval-style killing field. Suffering many casualties, the Soviets got beyond the main hall and started to work their way up through the building. The fire and subsequent wartime damage had turned the building's interior into a maze of rubble and debris amongst which the German defenders were strongly dug in. The Soviet infantry were forced to clear them out. Fierce room-to-room -room fighting ensued. As May Day approached Soviet troops reached the roof, but fighting continued inside. Moscow claimed that they hoisted the red flag on the top of the Reichstag at 22.50, however Beaver points out that this may have been an exaggeration as Soviet propaganda was fixated with the idea of the Reichstag being captured by 1st of May. Whatever the truth, the fighting continued as there was still a large contingent of German soldiers down in the basement. The Germans were well stocked with food and ammunition and launched counter-attacks against the Red Army, leading to close fighting in and around the Reichstag. Close combat raged throughout the night and the coming day of 1st of May, until the evening when some German troops pulled out of the building and crossed the Friedrichstrasse S-Bahn station. Where they moved into the ruins hours before the main breakout across the spree. About 300 of the last German combatants surrendered. A further 200 defenders were dead and another 500 were already or to combat, lying wounded in the basement, many before the final assault had started. The barricade at Pestalozzistrasse was taken on the morning of 1st of May, 
allowing Soviet tanks of the 34th Brigade to advance and to re-establish contact with the 19th Mechanized Brigade supported by the 2nd and 3rd Battalion of the 1st Regiment, which pushed through the barricades at Goethestrasse and Schillerstrasse. Further, heavily fortified German positions in and around the church at the Karl August Platz were taken, allowing the Polish and Soviet units to advance along the Goethestrasse and Schillerstrasse. In the meantime, the Polish 2nd Regiment, with its own artillery support, took the heavily fortified Berlin Institute of Technology that was situated in the triangle between Charlottenburger Strasse, Hardenberg Strasse, and Jebenstrasse. With support by the Polish 3rd Infantry Regiment, the Soviet 66th Guards Tank Brigade broke through Franklin Strasse and advanced towards the Berlin Tiergarten Station. The stronghold of the Tiergarten Station was then secured by the 3rd Infantry Regiment. Thereafter, Polish and Soviet units took control of the Zoologischer Garden Station and the railway line between them. By these actions, the Red Army had broken through the central Berlin West line of defense. Tank T-34 from the 7th Guards Tank Corps and captured militias from Volkssturm on the streets of Berlin at about 4 o'clock on 1st of May, Krebs talked to Chukov, commander of the Soviet 8th Guards Army. Krebs returned empty-handed after refusing to agree to an unconditional surrender. Only Reichskanzler Goebbels now had the authority to agree to an unconditional surrender. In the late afternoon, Goebbels had his children poisoned. At about 20 hundred hours, Goebbels and his wife, Magda, left the bunker and close to the entrance bit on a cyanide ampule, and either shot themselves at the same time or were given a coup de grace immediately afterwards by the SS guard detailed to dispose of their bodies. As promised by the Soviets, at 10.45 on 1st of May they unleashed a hurricane of fire on the German pocket in the center to force the Germans to surrender unconditionally. For a brief period after Hitler's suicide, Goebbels was Germany's Reichskanzler. On 1st of May, after Goebbels' own suicide, for an equally brief period, Reichspräsident Admiral Karl Dönitz appointed Ludwig von Kroschke as Reichskanzler. The headquarters of the Dönitz government were located around Flensburg, along with Murich, near the Danish border. Accordingly, the Dönitz administration was referred to as the Flensburg government. The commanders of two formidable Berlin fortresses agreed to surrender to the Soviets, so sparing both sides the losses involved in further bombardment and assault. The commander of the Zoo Flak Tower was asked to surrender on 30th of April, after a long delay a message was sent back to the Soviets on 1st of May informing them that the garrison would surrender to the Soviets at midnight that night. The reason for the delay was because the garrison intended to join in the attempt at a breakout. The other fortress was the Spandau Citadel of Trace Italien design which although several hundred years old presented a difficult structure to storm. After negotiations, the Citadel's commander surrendered to Lt. Gen. F. I. Perkorovich's 47th Army just after 1500 hours on 1 May. Breakout Weidendammer Bridge in 2006 Weidling had given the order for the survivors to break out to the northwest starting at around 2100 hours hours on 1 May. The breakout started later than planned at around 2300 hours hours. The first group from the Reich Chancellery was led by Mont. Bormann, Werner Naumann, and remaining four bunker personnel followed. Bergdorf, who played a key role in the death of Erwin Rommel, along with Krebs, committed suicide. Monk's group avoided the Weidendammer Bridge and crossed by a footbridge, but his group became split. A Tiger tank that spearheaded the first attempt to storm the Weidendammer Bridge was destroyed. There followed two more attempts and on the third attempt, made around one o'clock, Bormann and SS Dr. Ludwig Stumpfegger and another group from the Reich Chancellery managed to cross the spree. They were reported to have died a short distance from the bridge, their bodies seen and identified by Arthur Axman who followed the same route. Charlotten Bridge. Rebuilt in 1926, it survived World War II. Krukenberg and many of the survivors of the remnants of the Nordland Division crossed the spree shortly before dawn but could not break through and were forced back into the center. There they split up, some discarded their uniforms and tried to pass themselves off as civilians, but most were either killed or, like Krukenberg, captured. An attempt to break out northward along the Schönhauser Allee by German troops on the northeastern side of the central defense area failed. Because the Soviets were now aware that breakout attempts were being made and were hurriedly putting cordons in place to stop them. The remnants of the Munchenberg Division and the remnants of the 18th Panzer Grenadier and 9th Parachute Divisions broke out of the center westward through the Tiergarten. They were followed by thousands of stragglers and civilians. Spandau was still in the hands of a Hitler Youth Detachment, so an attempt was made to force a passage across the Charlotten Bridge over the Havel. Despite heavy shelling which killed many, 
German weight of numbers meant that they were able to drive the Soviet infantry back and many thousands crossed into Spandau. The armored vehicles that crossed the bridge made for Stocken. Mont could not break through the Soviet rings. Most were taken prisoner and some committed suicide. General Monk and the others who had been in the forward bunker were interrogated by Smersch. Only a handful of survivors reached the Elba and surrendered to the Western Allies. The majority were killed or captured by the Soviets. The number of German soldiers and civilians killed attempting the breakout is unknown. Capitulation General Helmut Weidling, the last commander of the Berlin defense appointed by Hitler, surrendered on May 2, along with members of his staff on the morning of 2 of May, the Soviets stormed the Reich Chancellery. In the official Soviet version, the battle was similar to that of the battle for the Reichstag. There was an assault over Willemplatz and into the building with a howitzer to blast open the front doors and several battles within the building. Major Anna Nikolina, a political officer with Lt. Gen. I.P. Rossley's 9th Rifle Corps of the 5th Shock Army carried and unfurled the red flag on the roof. However, Beaver suggests that the official Soviet description is probably an exaggeration, as most of the German combat troops had left in the breakouts the night before, and resistance must have been far less than that inside the Reichstag. At one o'clock hours, the Soviets picked up radio message from the German LVI Corps requesting a ceasefire and stating that emissaries would come under a white flag to Potsdamer Bridge. General Weidling surrendered with his staff at six o'clock hours. He was taken to see Lt. Gen. Chukov at 8.23 a.m. Chukov, who had commanded the successful defense of Stalingrad, asked, You are the commander of the Berlin garrison? Weidling replied, Yes, I am the commander of the LVI Panzer Corps. Chukov then asked, Where is Krebs? What did? He say? Weidling replied, I saw him yesterday in the Reich Chancellery. Weidling then added, I thought he would commit suicide. In the discussions that followed, Weidling agreed to an unconditional surrender of the city of Berlin. He agreed to order the city's defenders to surrender to the Soviets. Under the direction of Chukov and Soviet General Vasily Sokolovsky, Weidling put his order to surrender in writing. The 350 strong garrison of the Zoo Flak Tower finally left the building. There was sporadic fighting in a few isolated buildings where some SS still refused to surrender. The Soviets simply blasted any such building to rubble. Most Germans, soldiers, and civilians, were grateful to receive food issued at Red Army soup kitchens. The Soviets went house to house and rounded up anyone in a uniform including firemen and railwaymen, a total of 180,000 and marched them eastwards as prisoners of war. The Red Army made a major effort to feed the residents of the city which began on Colonel General Nikolai Berzerin's orders. However, in many areas, vengeful Soviet troops looted, raped and murdered civilians for several weeks. Thanks for watching.